Well, uh, for any organization to continue to be healthy and vibrant as it ages, uh, you have to constantly renew yourself. Now, the grad students know that they get sort of renewed on a five, uh, maybe, well, five to 10 year time scale, depends on <laughs> just how long they stay. Um, but it's also important that that, that uh, the senior people involved in, in the lab also get renewed. Human lifespan is, is, is limited. Um, and so we're, we're the, uh, Mike and I came sort of midway through the life of the lab. I was sort of late 70s. Mike was sort of mid to early 80s. Um, and we're still here. And um, in order to uh, continue that, we were fortunate to attract two uh, outstanding young uh, scientists uh, to Columbia just recently, and they both started on the faculty uh, as assistant professors just this January 1st, uh, Francesco Volpe uh, and uh, Andrew Cole. And uh, I'm not sure which of you wants to speak first. But okay, Francesco. All right. Um, I was scratching my head trying to think of a title for this talk. I, and I was struggling, and then I thought, well, maybe I, I will use the two words which um, always guided me and I try to use as my motto. And this is fantasy and enthusiasm, fantasia and enthusiasmo. And uh, this is the style I want to um, use as, a, as an assistant professor here at Columbia. Um, and as a group leader and uh, the style I think I've had as a um, student and then a postdoc. So just to introduce myself, I arrived, I was born in Naples, Italy, but I arrived to New York with a semi-random walk, passing through uh, uh, Pisa, where I did my undergrad studies, and then Frascati, the University of Trieste, uh, a stop in Germany for my PhD at Garking, the spherical tugmac mast in Calam. I did some simulation for either. Uh, I did a postdoc, uh, a second postdoc uh, at D3D, uh, in San Diego, uh, was hired in, uh, in, uh, in Germany um, at Garking, the Institute for Plasma, Plasma Physics. But shortly thereafter, I received an offer from UW Madison, which I thought it was very attractive. So I left my job in Germany, went to Madison, and ultimately I arrived here. Uh, I was lucky enough to do a couple of things along the way, uh, mostly in the field of microwaves microdiagnostics, uh, heating, current drive for Togamax accelerators, which are the first uh, four or five bullets. And then after modeling for ITER uh, for the upper launcher for ECCD, electron cycle current drive for neoclassical theory mode stabilization, I decided I wanted to do the experiments on those techniques. And uh, I worked with some wonderful people at GA about the experimental realization of those techniques. Um, I've been, moved, I've been moving around a number of times. I want to stop at Columbia for quite some time, and I think this is the perfect place um, for a long stop in which I can combine the best of two worlds, the university um, atmosphere uh, and the national and international facilities on the right. Um, Jerry was mentioning a new paradigm of work, uh, carrying on experiments at the FDR and then D3D and STX and so forth. Um, at the same time, I think here uh, at Columbia, uh, I have unique opportunities as far as uh, small um, tabletop and, and not so tabletop experiments um, are concerned, where you can really put your hands on the experiment uh, and teach much more effectively to grad students than you can do maybe in big facilities. Uh, Columbia has a long and successfully, a successful history in both of these um, areas. Um, the area is just a Incomplete list of machines, Columbia machines on the first row. Do we have a pointer? No? Okay, uh, I have a pointer. Uh, so we have a list of uh, a list of machines here at Columbia and a list of experiments in other, in other labs um, and in other institutions uh, with which uh, Columbia has worked intensely. In the first area of university scale experiments, something I would like to realize here at Columbia it's a collaboration with uh, particle and uh, nuclear physicists, uh, in particular from a group in, uh, in the, Institute, uh, the National Institute for uh, Nuclear Physics in Italy, um, but 
also, um, I'm trying to start a collaboration with colleagues at UC Berkeley. Um, in uh, accelerator physics, uh, it is be becoming increasingly common to inject uh, heavy ions in the accelerators and smash beams of heavy ions against each other or against targets for various basic studies as well as for uh, medical physics. And the sources for generating these ions which are injected in the accelerator are plasma-based. And uh, a concept, the electron signal resonant ion source, which is the cartoon shown on the top left, has been very successful in generating uh, um, uh, high-emittance beams of uh, highly charged ions with a very simple uh, cylindrical magnetic mirror concept uh, where additional confinement in the radial direction was provided by an hexapole. And the trend in this uh, research is now to go, this machine is, by the way, uh, electron signal heated. Uh, you heat the electrons to some very high temperatures, but you're interested in keeping the ions cold. You don't want a big angular spread of the beam that you struck from this device. Um, and there's been a continuous improvement to higher and higher frequency and to better and better uh, confinement regimes, but they are kind of, is there any Agris expert in the room? No, okay, so I can see that. They're kind of stuck now. Um, and um, um, probably the way, I, I mean, as a person who works on toroidal devices, the way to improve confinement is by closing the device in itself in a toroidal confinement device. Um, and also work on how to improve uh, the electrosecurating of these devices. Um, uh, I would therefore like to um, explore the concept of toroidal plasmas for ion sources uh, and uh, allow us, by the way, at the same time, um, a typical dish from epigen, which is one on the right, uh, and uh, the acronym for a toroidal apparatus for resonant absorption of low frequency waves and generation of highly charged ions. I lost a few words in the acronym at the end. Um, if you close this device in the cartoon on itself toroidally, you obtain an L equal, L equal 3 uh, stellarator. And Peralo has also uh, an elicity of L equal 3. Jokes apart, uh, um, we are in the conceptual design, which is called it in Italy, of a small device with a minor radius of 5 centimeters, major radius of 40 centimeters magnetic field of 2.5 Tesla, which would be the, the 70 gigahertz. It would be a short pulse device, but just to explore this new concept. Um, we don't need superconducting coils. Talking of stellarators, there is one already available here and very, was very successful, successfully uh, um, uh, created by, by Thomas Pedersen for uh, non-neutral plasmas. I want to use it for neutral plasmas, the N in CNT uh, will then stand for uh, neutral, uh, so it will be the Columbia neutral torus, will be reconfigured as a microheated machine at 2.45 gigahertz, uh, just the kind, kind of magnetrons you find in a microwave oven. It's a low aspect ratio device, as you can tell from this cartoon on the left. In addition to 2.45 gigahertz, uh, um, helicon um, heating will also be utilized. The goal of this two techniques is to generate a very high uh, density, very high pressure uh, plasma at the same time it, it has a low magnetic field. So it is interesting for two reasons. The high density brings us in the over dense heating regime, which have been working on in the past with electron bursting waves or EBWs, and there is a whole lot of new things to do on this. And uh, the combination of high pressure and low magnetic field brings us in high beta studies, which is a tradition at Columbia. Also, HBTP has the unique capability of moving the coils and experimentally studying the sensitivity of the equilibrium uh, confinement and stability properties of these plasmas to misalignment of the coils that generally you just evaluate numerically. Uh, the wave propagation in this device and in other experiments carried out in the past in uh, CTX and LDX will be analyzed with the help of a full wave code uh, in collaboration with colleagues at Stuttgart. This is a snapshot of the calculations made uh, with this code and also with a new um, numerical method called the wavefront tracing uh, based on the Huygens principle and uh, uh, a method which might combine the rapidity of the ray tracing uh, with the level of detail that you have in a full wave. And uh, let me say that CNT, CTX and LDX, all of which have been heated at 2.45 gigahertz and in the case of LDX also some higher frequencies are uniquely positioned for this kind of studies because they are wavelength which is comparable with the machine. The, the computation is not overly um, 
is not undoable, let's say, with present computational capabilities. At the boundary between university scale experiments and the national and international facilities, I would like to set up a, 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 a diagnostic lab in which diagnostics are developed at Columbia and then installed on other machines. This is, by the way, also the way the model superandi I had when I was in Wisconsin, um, in which by the way, I have a collaboration with the DTD Tomac, which we are continuing on the electron sector on emission. But there are other, other diagnostics which I would like to develop at DTD. Uh, you, you know that one of the hot topics now is uh, measuring magnetic fields in three dimensions. Uh, and one technique, there are some simple and yet I believe effective techniques in which you can do that by, for example, using magnetic nanorods suspended in a liquid um, uh, solvent. And uh, you can buy on Amazon for $7.75 uh, these little plates, and uh, they are 1D devices that allow you to make 1D measurements of magnetic field. You have flakes of nickel suspended in oil. The same concept can be easily generalized to three dimensions. Uh, into a higher time resolution. That device, by the way, is non reversible, the one on the right. But the, the concept can be easily made 3D and time resolved. And uh, by having, uh, so when the magnetic field uh, is strong and parallel to the, to the screen, all of these rods are aligned in one direction and they are obstructing the view of a red illumination, let's say, in red, whereas where the field is perpendicular, you see the red light behind. So the measurement of magnetic field is converted in a measurement of color. And if you have three components, you can convert three measurements of color in three, uh, a measure, measurement of three components. An RGB color will be an encoded, oh, okay, I'm running late already. All right, so let me go very quickly uh, to the next idea, which is using giant, you know what, I will just flash the slides because I have too much material, uh, which I think, it, I hope is good. Um, we can talk over dinner about the details. Uh, giant magnetic resistance is the principle by which uh, your art drive works. And it's generally used for uh, discrete measurements, zero or one. Uh, a, a digit is a, a record on your art drive is magnetized or not. But there is a whole lot of data in between zero and one, and it can be used for magnetic field measurements with a very high uh, temporal and spatial resolution. Um, is there something wrong with the picture on the right? On the right. So, we have two beams focused at two frequencies. Um, uh, the beams, monadic beams of the different frequencies, 110 and, and 90 gigahertz. Uh, chromatic aberration generally goes in the opposite direction. The 90 gigahertz beam uh, would have the focus, would, would have a longer uh, focal length than normally for a, for a, con con a conventional uh, um, lens. Um, in collaboration with a colleague at uh, W Madison, uh, we have developed a concept of metamaterial at zone lens, uh, which uh, uh, exhibits reverse chromatic aberration. The focal length has the opposite dependence on frequency. This has applications to diagnostics. We will have applications in ether to uh, electrostatic emitting, and there's applications to cameras. You can compensate the chromatic aberration of your Nikon or Canon camera with a reverse chromatic aberration component, giving very sharp images. There is a bar patent on that. Um, Ring Words is not just the title of a sci-fi movie, or uh, sorry, sci-fi book on the right, it's also a concept with, which we've used for very high temporal resolution interferometric measurements of the distribution of action of electron velocities in uh, the 3D, with three orders of mag magnitude improvement over the previous technique. My favorite is uh, using mode conversion in oblique reflectometry imaging to measure the edge Q in a range between 0 0.6 and 0 0.9 of normalized radius. Time's really bad, but uh, very briefly, there is a mode conversion from the first to the external to the ordinary mode, which is an angular dependence, and uh, it's such that light coming from the interior of the plasma escapes from the plasma along a special direction, and uh, the transmission to the cutoff layer has certain angular dependence. In correspondence of this peak and transmissivity, there must be a hole Light. And this technique has the potential of extending to overdense, to non overdense plasma, so to any plasma really, uh, a technique which uh, uh, has been recently, uh, recently demonstrated on mass and could provide uh, detailed measurement of the HQ profile, which is always a, is an important and not always easy measurement. Uh, 
Um, going back to collaborations with D3D, diagnostic, but I should say also stability collaborations, uh, the oblique electron cyclone emission has been used um, in feedback with the electron cyclone current drive for stabilization of the classical turning modes in D3D, the D3D topmac, and uh, there is a number of upgrades going on uh, on that that we are collaborating upon. I have no time to go into details. But this brings me naturally in the next and last topic of this brief presentation, or not so brief presentation, uh, the national and international uh, collaborations. At D3D, uh, similar, related to what you were seeing in one or two slides ago, um, okay, that, that slide was about uh, controlling a mode, uh, an island which is rotating. Uh, but what if the island locks, and uh, it locks in a position in which it is not accessible? to a millimeter wave beam by which we can suppress it. Well, by the use of magnetic fields, uh, we can reposition the island, as you can see in the right, in such a way that we can drive current in the correct location, red ribbon, the opposite of the island, uh, giving stabilization. Uh, this concept uh, has been demonstrated in D3D, can be further improved. We want to make it uh, even more iter relevant and integrated in a disruption avoidance uh, system. Lock modes are frequent causes of disruptions. Um, a generalization of that is, I'm sorry, Jerry, but I will be quick. Uh, I'm over, okay, all right, sorry. Uh, all right, it, very briefly, if you give me a compass and a magnet, I'm not going to do it now, but I can tell you where the other magnets are, and I can tell you how strong they are and what the multiple order uh, of these uh, magnets are. Now, these unknown magnets are the unknown narrow fields in a machine. So by using a uh, rotating mode, um, which is the analogous of our compass, and by using um, uh, uh, deliberate perturbation, which is the analogous of that moving magnet, we can sense magnetic fields, and this theory on the right uh, for respectively the amplitude uh, of phase and angular velocity of a, a mode rotating in the x 32 r versus 15 inch in Sweden agrees, I believe, very well with the measurements that we carried out on the right. We want now to extend this technique to Tomax. This was a reversely pinch we want to do it uh, in D3D, and in fact, I also propose how to do it here on HPTP. It's a technique which I believe is either relevant uh, because it's inherently working also at type beta. It's a non destructive technique. You don't need to lower the density of the, the plasma, and you, need, you don't need a low density lock mode uh, disruption. Um, a biology slide in the middle of a physics presentation. Fast neutrons kill cancer cells. This is very well known. It happens because they destroy DNA strands, as you see on the left. Neutrons do not penetrate very much in tissues. They just penetrate by a few uh, millimeters. It depends, of course, on the energy. But MEB neutrons penetrate by a few uh, millimeters. And they're therefore, if you selectively deposit fast neutrons in the correct location, you can kill carcinogenic cells of superficial can um, cancers. And it works, as you can see on the right. But generally, they use big accelerator facilities or big fission facilities, reactors, fission reactors. Um, my proposal is to use uh, atomic. Um, fusion neutrons happen to have exactly the correct energy uh, in the MAB range, uh, and exactly, uh, you know, as more than sufficient uh, flux, this number is so estimated for the uh, D3D, and this is what you need for the therapy. So the idea is to use this, the idea is to use this for uh, cancer therapy. I stop because I think the jury is becoming uh, angry. Maybe one more thing, uh, and, uh, and, one, and one more thing. And let me stop here, but uh, Jerry said that I could be, you know, can dream, okay, then here is, here is one dream, and uh, here is the content of that dream, and that dream will involve other institutions. Okay, thanks for your attention.